Hey everybody. Hello. Good to see you again. We're going to continue our study of Jesus in the book of Luke. Last time we looked at his baptism and his temptation. Today we're going to follow him back up into Galilee and see what was he doing up there? What was his message? What was he trying to tell everyone? So let's take a look at it. Here we go. Okay, so as I said, you remember last time we were looking at Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist there in the Jordan River. We talked about the dove that appeared, the voice from heaven. And of course, immediately after that, he was taken by the Holy Spirit immediately up into the desert there, the desert of Judea, where he was tempted by the devil. And after he was finished with that, we come to the next verse. So let's go ahead and read that. Karen, would you read for us? And Jesus returned to the Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and a report went out about him throughout all the surrounding region. Okay, so people were starting to hear about this guy, Jesus, and what he was doing, his ministry. Next verse. And he was teaching in all their synagogues, being praised by all. All right, so he was going around teaching in different synagogues. What's our question? Was this normal for teachers to go around from synagogue to synagogue? Yeah, was that the normal thing to do at the time? Yes. Yeah, it was. This is what the Pharisees would do. They would go around, followed by a group of followers, disciples, go into a synagogue and preach there on a Sabbath, and then they'd move on to another place the next week. So this was quite a normal thing for the religious teachers of the time to do. Okay, next verse. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been raised, and he entered into the synagogue, as he usually did on the Sabbath day, and stood up to read. Okay, so he's back to his hometown, teaching in the synagogue there too. And it says, as he usually did on the Sabbath day. So this was his normal procedure to teach on Sabbaths. And it says he stood up to read. Okay, so what's our question? How was Bible reading done on the Sabbath? Yeah, how, how did they do Bible reading in the Sabbath? What, what was the service like in the synagogue? Just to give us a little background about that. So here we got a picture of an old synagogue a little bit after the time of Jesus, but still gives us an idea of what they looked like. And we've got an order of service in the synagogue here. So they'd start out with prayers, and they would say these standing, facing towards Jerusalem. And then you'd have the priestly benediction. And then after that, a reading from the Torah, the five books of Moses. There was also a second scripture reading. That would be the lesson from the prophets, the Haftorah. And this would be followed by a sermon, the Darashah which would be concluded with a final prayer, and they would sing from the Psalms. And then on the way out, they'd give money for the poor to the collector. This was called tzedakah, the donation money. And the service length was, you know, around an hour, something like that. So this just gives us an idea of how everything fit together. And as we just saw in the verse, that Jesus stood up to read from the prophets. So this would be the second reading in the synagogue service. All right, well, at the very beginning of the service, they start out with something called the Shema. And what is that? Well, that's just the recitation of verse from Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. And you can still hear people singing this in the synagogues today, even some of the churches in uh, Jerusalem. You'll hear them sing this before their scripture reading. And it goes, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. And then they put on a little uh, response here. Baruch Shem Kavod Malkuto Leolam Vahed. And so, a very familiar sound in the synagogues at the beginning of the service on uh, Saturday morning, on Shabbat morning. Okay, well, let's continue the next verse, Karen. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. And having unrolled the scroll, he found the place where it was written. Okay, so here he's getting the scroll of the prophet. So he's doing the second reading, the reading of the prophets. And he's got the scroll, he unrolls it, and he finds the place where he's going to read. Okay, so what's our question? Who gave him the scroll? Yeah, who was it that handed him the scroll? Must have been someone whose job was to give the scroll to the one who was going to read it. <laughs> yes, and this person was known as the Chazan. 
So this Chazan was kind of a helper around the synagogue. Some people have compared him to a church warden or a janitor even. He'd keep the place clean. If it was a synagogue where they were teaching kids, which um, so many of the synagogues did, if there were kids in the area, they would be the school teacher for the kids as well. This was the, you know, the earliest example we have of public education uh, among the Jewish people when they were teaching the young boys in the synagogue schools. And you can see there in the upper left-hand corner an example of a Torah scroll. Now, as you can see, they're pretty big and they're quite heavy. They're made out of parchment, which is animal skin, and they're written only on one side, as you can see in the example there. Now, in Jesus' day, these were kept in an ark, the Torah ark, which was actually a cabinet on wheels. So if you look at the picture in the middle there, you can see the little cabinet, and then underneath it, the wheels. So this was a representation in a later synagogue of how they used to do it. This opened up at the end. Maybe you can make out the doors on the right side and you would slip the scrolls inside. Each Bible book was a different scroll. So uh, this was quite an expensive thing. These were all handwritten scrolls. And even today, the scrolls that are used in the synagogue are handwritten on parchment, just like in ancient times. So they're unbelievably expensive. And today, if you look at the right-hand side, uh, they will keep the scrolls in these decorated boxes. You see the circular looking box with the decorated elements on the top and they take these out and march around with them in celebration when they come to the time of year when they finish the reading of the whole of the Torah that is the whole of the books of Moses and are going to start again so uh, that's the way that they store them today they have them in these containers and these are kept in the cabinet at the front of the synagogue today but in Jesus day they kept them in this little cabinet on wheels that we see in the picture in the middle. And uh, you might wonder, well, why did they have these Torah scrolls in this little cabinet on wheels? And the idea was that the synagogue was the largest room in the town. And there was occasion when they needed to use that for something else. So they could just roll that synagogue scroll arc out of the synagogue. And then that room could be used for something else. We also have records of them taking the Torah Ark out into the town when it was a day of fasting. For example, a day of fasting had been proclaimed, and we have records that they would bring the Torah Ark out on those days. So uh, it was used in uh, different ways like this. Okay, so that just gives us an idea about the scrolls and about the Chazan, who would be the person to help with the scrolls. So let's continue now. Verse 18. A spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to send out the oppressed in freedom. Okay, and continue. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Okay, so this is the section that he was reading from, do you remember what it was? Isaiah. Right, the book of Isaiah, okay. And our question? Where is this from in verses 18 and 19? Yeah, so the whole section that he read from Isaiah is in verses 18 and 19. Well, it comes from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. And would you read that, please? A spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim a year of favor for the Lord and a day of vengeance for our God to comfort all who mourn. Okay, good. So what's our question? What is this year of favor? Yeah, what do you think he's talking about there? A year of favor for the Lord. Um, <laughs> not sure. <laughs> yeah, well, actually nobody's quite sure about it. Some people have taken this to mean it was the year of Jesus' ministry. And these are people who would say that Jesus only had a one year ministry, although I think most people would count it up as three years of ministry. So that uh, doesn't quite fit. Uh, another possibility is that this year of favor is reflecting back, remember that jubilee year that they would have once every 50 years when all the debts were forgiven and things like that. So it's certainly referring to that, that occasionally God has this special year in which things are made right. And it might also refer not just to a single year, but to a time of favor. So. Generally, the gospel era is being introduced by Jesus. So I think that's how many people would understand it, that he's introducing something very similar to the Jubilee year. 
so that it's a time of God's favor, and that is the gospel message being preached to all mankind. Okay, what's the follow-up question? Why didn't Jesus read the part about vengeance? Yeah, he stopped immediately before the section where it says a day of vengeance for our God. Why do you think he didn't read that part? Because what he was, his life was related to at this moment was the favor, the year of favor for the Lord. Right, he's bringing in the time of favor. The day of vengeance will come, but that will be later. That seems to be pretty clearly his message. All right, let's continue the next verse. And having rolled up the scroll, having given it back to the assistant, he sat down, and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. All right, so he finished the reading, rolled the scroll back up, he gave it to this chazan, here's the assistant, the chazan, and he sat down. So what's the question? Why were they looking at him? Yeah, if he's done reading and he sat down, he's finished, right? Or at least that's the way I thought about it. That's the way it used to be in the church that I was raised in. But actually, it was quite different in the synagogue. The person who did the scripture reading would then be the person to give the message. And the person giving the message would sit down to do it. Now, this is the seat of Moses that's referred to by Jesus in one of his sayings, Matthew 23, I believe it is. And we actually have found one of these seats in Chorazin, one of the biblical cities up there near the Sea of Galilee. Now, this seat would have been put up on a little platform. So if you look to the right, you can see from uh, the area of Greece and Turkey, you can see the little steps going up to the platform, and originally the seat of Moses would have sat up in there. And the reason for this is that the person giving the message would sit down to preach while the people were standing in the synagogue. So, of course, he had to be up a little bit higher. And this seat of Moses is a seat of authority in Jewish tradition. When the rabbi uh, interprets for you, the law of Moses from the seat, it has authority, you're supposed to obey it. So that's how Jesus uses the expression, the seat of Moses, there in Matthew 23. The scribes and Pharisees have seated themselves in the seat of Moses, therefore everything that they tell you, do and obey. Okay, let's continue. Now he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Okay, so the scripture that he read from Isaiah, he says, is fulfilled. And the question? How was it fulfilled? Yeah, so here it is. That's the same verse that he just read, or two verses in Luke. Um, what does he mean that it's now fulfilled? Today it's fulfilled. Because he was doing those things. He was preaching good news to the poor, and he was proclaiming release to captives, and blind people were seen, and all, all these things were happening. Yeah, he's saying, I am the fulfillment of this verse. A spirit of the Lord is on me. So Jesus is not just reading this as a kind of a general prophecy. He's saying, I am that. I am the fulfillment of what Isaiah is talking about now. And as you said, he was doing it. He was preaching the good news to the poor. He was proclaiming release to the captives. What do you think that means, release to the captives? Freedom from slavery to sin. Yeah, it could be slavery to sin, could be slavery to evil spirits. He was certainly doing that. Recovery of sight to the blind. We know that Jesus healed the blind. So he's saying, I am the fulfillment of this prophecy. Okay, next verse. And all were speaking well of him and were wondering at the gracious words that were going out of his mouth. And they were saying, isn't this the son of Joseph? Right, so they were enjoying his message, right? They were saying, wow, this is our hometown boy. We're very proud of him. Uh, he's doing a good job preaching. Okay, what's our question? Why did they mention Joseph? You know, why do they think they brought up uh, that he's the son of Joseph? Everybody knew. Yeah, everybody knew him. He knew his family, and Joseph was a, a laborer there in town. A carpenter is how it's sometimes translated, but actually... It's more of somebody who would work with stone, build, building the stone houses, a builder. But he's a common laborer, not the kind of person you would expect to be doing something official in the synagogue. And here is his son, and his son is preaching amazingly well in the synagogue. So they were kind of shocked. This is not the person you would expect to be coming to preach in the synagogue. Okay, next verse. And he said to them, No doubt you will say to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. Do things as great as we have heard took place in Capernaum, here in your hometown, too. Okay, good. What, what is this proverb all about? What do you think it means, physician, heal yourself? 
So if you're a doctor, then you shouldn't be sick because you should your medicine should work for you as well as it works for other people. Okay, uh, but in context, why do you think he's using it right here? What does he mean by it? He knows that they want him to show them something. Right, so in other words, physician to yourself, they're saying you, you have ability to heal, well do it right here in your hometown. Yourself meaning your people here in Nazareth, right? So he's expecting that they are expecting him to do miracles like they heard he had done in other places. Okay, good, let's continue. But he said, Amen I say to you that no prophet is welcome in his own country. Why would he say that? This sounded to me like they're pretty open to him. They will be to a point, but they still, <laughs> the son of Joseph, the, the carpenter, day laborer. You think that they couldn't receive from him because he was the son of Joseph? Maybe because they knew, knew him. Mm -hmm. And why would that be a problem? Because people don't always respect the ones that come from among them. Yeah, but up until now they've been talking very positively about him, right? You know, there's a good buzz going about around, hey, he's speaking very well. And then he comes out with this. I say that no prophet is welcome in his own country. That's, that's kind of a sudden turn. So what's Jesus doing here? Let's continue. But in truth I say to you, there were many widows in the days of Elijah in Israel, when heaven was shut up for three years and six months as a great famine was on all the land. Okay, so he's telling us about Elijah. Let's continue. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to a widow woman in Zarephath of Sidon. So uh, Elijah was not sent to the widows of Israel. He only went to this widow woman in Zarephath. So why didn't Elijah help the widows of Israel? I don't know. Well, uh, let's go to the second question first. Who was this woman in Zarephath? Well, she was a widow. She's a widow, okay. And where's she living? Is that a pagan area? Sidon, right, along the coast. It was a pagan area. So uh, she is a, a pagan, actually. If you read the story, she talks about the Lord your God. It's not her God, but it's Elijah's God. So she was a, a Gentile woman uh, living in Sidon, which was a non-Jewish city. Although there were probably some Jewish people living there, but overall it was a pagan city. And so uh, why didn't Elijah help the widows of Israel? Why only this Gentile woman, pagan woman, uh, living outside of Israel? Let's keep going with Jesus' sermon, the next verse. And there were many lepers in Israel at the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian. Okay, good. And what ethnic group was Naaman? Syrian. Syrian. So again, a person outside of Israel received the miracle, but none of the other lepers in Israel received the miracle. Why is that? Why was he cleansed and not others? If we think about what's going on in these stories, we realize that this was at a time when Israel was in terrible apostasy away from the Lord. Elijah was in the time of Ahab and Jezebel. In the time of Elisha, it was almost nearly as bad. The people were worshiping other gods. They were not serving God faithfully. And so who is it that turns in faith to God to be healed, to be ministered to? It's these foreigners, these Gentiles, are having more faith than Israel itself. It's kind of a shocking thing, and it's certainly a shocking message that Jesus is giving here when he's talking about what happened in the past, and he's relating it to what's going on right at that moment in his own life. So just jumping back a couple of verses, the story of Elijah, the story of Elisha, were given to illustrate his statement that no prophet is welcome in his own country. And so we know that was true at the time. King Ahab was trying to catch and to kill Elijah. Elijah and Elisha were not uh, welcomed by many of the people in the population of Israel. And so this was a real problem at that time. And Jesus is saying it's still a problem right now. Next verse. And all in the synagogue were filled with rage when they heard these things. Okay, so when he said this about God ministering to those Gentiles instead of to Israel in the time of Elijah and Elisha, so why were they angry? Because they didn't like it that uh, he was pointing out that this favor was shown to a pagan people. Yeah, he, they didn't like it because they were very familiar with these stories and they knew that God was not ministering 
to Israel at that time because of their sin. They were sinful, they were an apostasy away from God, and that's why miracles were not done. So for Jesus to use this to point to them, he's basically saying, you are like those Israelites of old. You are in sin, you're in disbelief, and so therefore, don't expect that God is going to do every, anything for you. Oh, wow, that hit them really hard. And I can imagine it would hit us hard too if we were there at the time, residents of Nazareth, and heard him go in this direction, right? They were furious. Okay, next verse. And having got up, they drove him out of the city and led him to the edge of the mountain on which their city had been built, so they might throw him down from the cliff. Right, so how high was this cliff? Well, that's a very high cliff. It's a very high cliff, right? So if you look in the picture in the background here, you can just barely see the church there right in the center. And then if you let your eye go straight up to the top middle of the picture, you see there's kind of a hill there on the outskirts of town. And on the other side, it's a steep cliff dropping down, not to the level of the town itself, but to the level of the valley far below. So if you look there at the very top, you can see, you can just barely make out in the haze, a city, a modern city, way down lower than the city of Nazareth, which is in the foreground. That's how far down that cliff face goes. So uh, this is another view of it, the amount of precipitation. And we're looking at the top where they would take people to throw them off. And way down over there on the right hand side, quite a bit below, it's almost like looking down from an airplane, is the Jezreel Valley. And that's 300 meters down, 985 feet down. So this was a, a very dangerous cliff to take somebody to. They'd definitely die if you pushed them off of that at the right point. Now, why were they taking him to the edge of the cliff to throw him off? I thought the penalty for blasphemy, which is what they thought he was doing, was stoning. Well, it was the procedure in those days to do stoning, that they take you to a high place, throw you down, and if that didn't kill you, then they would throw stones at you. So that's just the way they did it. It's recorded in the writings of the rabbis, so we know it quite well. Uh, I mentioned briefly that they thought he was blaspheming. Now, why did I say that? Because he was, in effect, judging their hearts. And according to the Jewish belief, judgment belongs only to the Lord. Only God can do that. So by him judging their hearts, he was, in fact, making himself to be in the position of God. And of course, we know he was God, but they did not know he was God. And so this is part of what made them so angry that they wanted to take him and kill him for blasphemy, throw him down from the cliff. Okay, next verse. But he, having passed through their midst, went away. Yeah, it says he just walked away. Now, how's that possible? How was he able to get away when they're so angry they wanted to kill him? Yeah, how did he just walk <laughs> through the crowd and go back down the hill? Right. Well, we don't know because the Bible doesn't tell us the details. It could have been that he just exercised divine authority and, you know, just walked away. But it's interesting that somebody has suggested another way of looking at this. They measured the distance from the ancient center of the town to the place at the top of the cliff, and they found out it was a little bit more than a Sabbath day's journey. This is the amount of distance that you are allowed to travel on the Sabbath day without it being considered work. And the top of this hill is just a little bit beyond that. So if they had taken him all the way to the top of the cliff to throw him off, they themselves would then suddenly be guilty of violating the Sabbath, which was also a serious offense. So the idea is that because they were not able to take him all the way to the top of the cliff, they just had to let him go and he walked away. This is a very interesting solution to the problem. Help us to understand how it was that he was able to get away so easily. Okay, next verse. And he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on Sabbaths. Okay, so he left Nazareth, he goes to Capernaum, which is right on the Sea of Galilee, as you can see in the reconstruction image here. This is a picture of the real place, but we just kind of put in something to look more like the ancient village there. And, uh, but it says went down. Why does it say went down? Because Nazareth was up high, and Capernaum was next to the Sea of Galilee. Right, exactly. The Sea of Galilee is, is way down below sea level, 210 meters or about 700 feet below sea level. 
So if you look at the picture over on the right hand side, and you look at the very bottom, there's like a cross section, and you see I've got the sides uh, two different colors, black and gray. So the line separating, you know, right between the black and the gray, that's about sea level. So about halfway down into this bowl-shaped cavity in which the Sea of Galilee is placed. And so that means if you're looking at the picture on the left, sea level is about halfway down those cliffs, and then all the rest of the way down, that's all below the Mediterranean sea level. So if you look back again at the map on the right-hand side, you see the dark black line marking out the Sea of Galilee itself. But if you look just beyond that, you see there's a very erratic grayish line zigzagging all around the sea. That's the approximate location of the cliff edges, just like you see in the picture on the left, the edge of the cliff up there on top. Because the land around the Sea of Galilee is kind of like a flat table. And it's like somebody just carved out this huge deep pit in the middle of it, and the Sea of Galilee sits in that pit. So that's what we're showing there. And while we're looking at the map, if you look up in the middle of the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee, you can see a black square there, which is connected with the name Capernaum, right? So right there on the edge of the shore is where Capernaum was located, to which uh, Jesus moved when he left Nazareth and began teaching there in the synagogue. Okay, next verse. And they were amazed at his teaching, for his word was with authority. Okay, so this is talking about him teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. Uh, gee, I wonder what that synagogue in Capernaum looked like. Well, fortunately, it's been found. This is the ruins of the synagogue at Capernaum. You can see there's Karen right there with our daughter Tammy at the other end of it, so it's quite a large room. It looked a little bit different in uh, Jesus' day, so in the bottom left-hand corner is a reconstruction of what that looked like in Jesus' day. And if you look in the upper left-hand corner, you can see the basic outline of a, a typical synagogue. It's showing this one, but the others were pretty much the same. So we're looking down from above, so you see the dark outer black wall. And in front of that, you see little lines. Those are kind of like steps going around the outside that could be used as seats for the elderly, for the infirm, could sit there while other people were standing for the service. And the circular black dots, those are the columns holding up the, uh, the roof. And there at the bottom side, you see some little square things there near the doors. And this is the platform where they would have the seat of Moses and the table for reading the scroll. And that thing in the bottom left-hand corner is trying to show the ark that is that wheeled cabinet in which they put the Torah scrolls. Now, the white synagogue that I just showed you a picture of and that we can see here in the top part of the picture, this was built a little bit after the time of Jesus, but it was built directly over the ruins of the synagogue from Jesus' day. So those black stones you see there are not just a foundation, I mean, they served as a foundation, but they're actually the remnants of the wall of the earlier synagogue. If you look really carefully at the picture on the left, you can see that the line of the black wall is just slightly different than the line of the white wall. So this is one of the many pieces of evidence that the archeologist used to determine that that black uh, section had been built as part of a previous building. It was not simply built as a foundation for the white synagogue. So that black stone synagogue. That was the one that Jesus ministered in, and it was exactly as large as the white one that was later built. So the size is the same, and so it gives us a very good idea of what the synagogue at Capernaum was like in Jesus' day. Okay, let's go to the next verse. And in the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice. Wow, that would have been a little <laughs> bit frightening, a little disturbing. So have you ever seen anything like this? Uh, I think I did one time. Yeah, we've had uh, experiences like that when we were missionaries in the Philippines. People with demon problems and we pray for them and uh, the demon will come out sooner or later depending on the person and the situation. It happens even today sometimes. Okay, next verse. Ha, what do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Okay, so the demon is talking out of the man to Jesus, 
and identifies Jesus as the Holy One of God. What do you think that means, the Holy One? Someone special and set apart from others. Yeah, holy just means set apart, right? So set apart for some special purpose. So Jesus, of course, was set apart for a purpose. He's the Holy One of God. Okay, good. And next verse. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And the demon, having thrown him down in the middle, came out of him and didn't hurt him at all. So what exactly did Jesus do to get that demon to go out? He just rebuked him. He said, Be quiet and come out. Yeah, he just spoke to him. Right? He didn't do any other kind of actions, just by his words, he was able to drive that demon out. Okay, next verse. And they were all overcome with amazement, and were talking with each other, saying, What word is this? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. Okay, so they were pretty shocked by what he did, but why were they surprised? Weren't there other people also casting out demons? Maybe, but maybe it took a lot longer, or maybe it wasn't such a common thing. Well, no, there actually were people whose profession it was to go around from village to village casting out demons. But when they did it, it was quite a long and involved process. It would take all day. You know, they'd be burning incense and saying prayers and writing things on plates and breaking the plates, and it went on and on. And of course, you had to pay for it. So Jesus, just simply speaking a few words, and for that demon to go out, that was quite amazing. They had never seen anything like that before. Okay, next verse. And a report about him was going out to every place in the surrounding region. Right, you better believe it. People would hear about this. This was, you know, back in those days, it wasn't such a populous area compared to the kind of populations we have today. So word got around, you know, people heard about it. People knew about the miracles that Jesus was doing. Okay, so that's it. A good look at Jesus ministering in the synagogue. We're getting an introduction to his message. But of course, there's much more of his message coming in the chapters following in the book of Luke. I hope that you'll join us. Thanks for being here today. See you. Bye-bye.